our flow for today. Um, we'll just give you a quick little blurb about ALOC and Tie Online. I know Brittany and Meadow are here. Um, we'll jump into our agreements and then right into our conversation with Yvette and with Joel. We're looking forward to um, today and listening to um, their, their work, uh, their writing that was put forth into the international education community and uh, just engage in a dialogue. And then for us to reflect on um, what they're saying and think about implications on our own work in our own context. So quickly about ALOC. Um, ALOC is, stands for Association of International Educators and Leaders of Color. We're devoted to amplifying the work of international educators and leaders of color and focusing on advocacy, learning, and research. All right, good morning, Brittany and Meadow. I'll turn it over to you all just to share a little bit, a bit about Thai Online. Hi, I'm Brittany and I am part of the International Educator in Thai and I just wanted to say thank you to Kevin and to everybody for joining us today and especially to Yvette and to Joel. I just uh, thank you for stepping up and sharing your voices and also for your incredible perseverance um, through all this time really stepping up in our community and calling us all to action. So I will I'll let you take it from there, but thank you all for participating today. Definitely. Thanks, Brittany. All right, so if you did not see in June, Thai Online published Black Lives Matter. It was a series of stories, quotes from black educators and leaders from around the world. Um, our big focus with this was to make sure that the conversation persists um, beyond the written word. Um, and so that is why we're hosting different webinars and discussions, centering the voices of black indigenous people of color, um, those who are allies, co-conspirators from our global community to highlight that this is work that we all need to do. Um, and again, we thank you for joining us. Um, also joining us today, which will be our guest moderator along with myself is Tony Dennis. He just jumped on board. I'll introduce him and then we'll hop right into our um, agreements and then into our uh, dialogue with Joel and Yvette. Tony is an entrepreneur, storyteller, and educator, and he's based in Maryland. He has worked in China, South Korea, and Peru, and he has experience curating events centered around history, race, and the arts within South Korea and China. So, Tony, welcome. Hey, good to be here. And uh, just small correction, uh, Tony Deneen. Deneen is my last name. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Help me out. So I was checking these names. Thank you. So Tony Denis is joining us. I'm still letting some folks in as they are, um, have, are registered. So for us, 2020 has been a call as an international community to engage in conversation and action against COVID and racism. Our two um, colleagues that are joining us today um, really sort of put forth in words, articles, that sparked conversation, discussion. Um, if you've not seen or read those articles, no worries, we're gonna put those in the chat and in the follow-up um, resources that go out to everyone. Uh, but we're gonna, again, we usually start with these four in terms of our agreements for all of us to stay engaged. Um, if we're feeling uncomfortable, that's a good thing. We need to experience discomfort, being open to speaking our truth and knowing that an hour is not going to solve everything. So we expect and accept that there's non-closure uh, non um, during this period. So we're gonna open with our two um, guests who are gonna be sharing a little bit about just uh, their background and their articles and what sparked it. And Tony and I will um, just hop in in terms of asking questions and follow-ups. And then we all as a community will have a chance to ask questions. Um, as well as reflect on the conversation during our breakouts. So let's start with uh, Yvette. Yvette wrote an article um, in April that caused us to sort of look at and think about um, where we were with COVID as well as where we were with racism. So bringing these two together. So we'll start with Yvette. And Yvette, just give us a little bit of background in terms of what was the spark behind that article that you wrote um, for international school counselors. Hi. Um, so I think I was inspired by just thinking about like my own um, 
personal background being Filipino American um, and what was going on back home uh, in the States with um, coronavirus and racism directed towards Asians um, and Asian Americans. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a member of the ISCA task force, um, we're, ex we're part of our role is to, you know, write articles for the newsletter um, for the International School Counselors Associate, Association newsletter um, and I was kind of inspired by what was going on uh, back home as well as around the world in terms of um, uh, race and racism and then you know things sort of blew up uh, with the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery um, and I was reminded of the work that was done in 2016 um, by an organization called Hashtag Letters for Black Lives, um, which was started by Asian Americans in the US um, in terms of um, reaching out to older generations and explaining the importance of um, our role as allies in the movement and um, the benefits that we've received from uh, the work that Black Americans have put forth um, with the civil rights movement and everything. So it's been kind of like a combination of all those things. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Joel, um, and I go by the pronoun he and him. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, going back to the question that Kevin shared with us, um, and first, I'm, I'm based here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, it, at the very beginning, it was really, it was not, there's no plan at all. There wasn't any plan to, to write anything. There was no plan to, to think about it because I was in a place of comfort. It was, it was it's comfortable. Um, I've had my first leadership experience in international school. I've been, I've been supported by allies, like co-conspirators who have supported me in, in my move in international schools. And with that particular experience, I felt like I've already sort of broke the, that kind of ceiling, the metaphorical breaking the ceiling. And so when the recent surge of conversations with, um, in international school on, on racism, I've been involved in some conversations with alumni in, in different groups and different schools. And what was really compelling is that, is the experience of children within our international school. And that was the one that really, sort of the impetus of, of that petition that I wrote. I've been also involved in, in accreditation in many, in many parts. And I, I, I recognize and value the, the power of accreditation in terms of systemically um, holding international schools accountable. And so what, going back to that conversation with, with alumni, where you know that there's so many things that could happen that's beyond, that's our blind spot in our international school, I felt that it is, it was a, or it is, a, a child protection issue. Um, and that started out the conversation. That started out when I had to go back to my table and develop the petition. And at some point I was, I was scared. I was, you know, you are trying to, to sort of call out um, an, 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 an institution, an organization. Um, but at the same time, I thought about it coming from a place of, coming from a place of care, a place of partnership, a place of this is, I'm part of this organization, I'm part of this institution, and if I continue to move on in my career in, in the era of international education that we are now, the cycle continues, and if we don't break that one, we will continue to have an international school that's built on some of the systemic racism that it's, that's, that's, it's built upon. And so for me, those are some of the, the conversations that, that started, and I thought, you know, five people signed up to the petition until such time that it became around 3,000 plus and it involved different people. And so it was really encouraging, but at the same time, it is also um, a, a challenge for all of us, not only to sign the petition and to call out our organization, but to actually do the work ourselves. And so we started out talking and I know that I'm, I'm so fortunate to be, to be supported by, by ALOF and Diversity Collaborative and Thai Online when they, when they reach out to talk about it. And so committees were formed in, in different schools 
in my former school, International of Brussels and International of Kuala Lumpur, we sort of had that initial meeting along with Diversity Collaborative and ALOF. And we also have a separate meeting with Thai online and, and the amplification of that. And so what he was trying to say is that sometimes small change that initially when you feel like fearful about it, can actually spark some of different different conversations. And no matter how uncomfortable that can be, we have to go back to our why. Why does it matter? What, what are we here for in international school? And it goes back to that whole idea that we are here for our children and we cannot continue um, perpetuating um, oppressive systems that have oppressive structures that are isolating, that, that silence people, that, that may not be something that will amplify identities of, of individuals. Thank you both. And then since writing your articles, what are, what are some things that you've noticed, things that have transpired, um, changes, even in the international education community? I know, Joe, you spoke of things that are going on at your school. With, um, with International School of Kuala Lumpur, what, what happened was that I initially, you know how it is when you try to sort of address a bigger systemic um, context, I also had to, to carefully navigate it within my own school. And I had to speak my, with my head of school and both of them, my, my head of school, my director of learning, as well as our leadership team in, in the elementary school have been very supportive and, 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 and caring and kind about the whole process. And so we, we rounded up people and there were so many people who reached out and said, we need to have a conversation. And I think it goes back to that whole idea of like turning to each other. It is uncomfortable, but I think when we begin to, to grapple with that uncomfortable feeling and uncomfortable thinking that, that compel us to change, we can go back and, and look into each other and turn to each other and, and have the conversation together. And so what happened is that we sort of provided a voice and a choice for, for those people who are there to look into the three spheres of influence. And one is a self-reflection, personal growth. The second one is for people who would like to look into teaching and learning and curriculum. And the other one is on the third sphere is on systemic, looking at hiring, looking at um, admissions, looking at different things that we have systemically in the international school. We are at the initial stage um, at iScale. Um, we haven't had our second meeting yet, but the first meeting already is, is, is a start. Um, and we hope that we will continue the movement as opposed to just continue the moment during the summer. Um, on the other hand, what I know as well with the International School of Brussels is that they start to have a conversation with their leadership team um, and, and they, they had a chat about it. So I think conversations, um, knocking on the doors of, of our heads of schools and our leaders, and I know that sometimes based on the, I, I just recently recorded a podcast with Trisha Friedman, um, and be, be a better ally. Sometimes the, the we have to, especially with people of color, people who speak a second language, um, sometimes we have to navigate through different layers of that within the intersectional class, race, and gender. Um, but I, I think it's, it's courage and, and going back to our why that actually will, will fire us up to really knock on those doors and say, we, there's something that needs to be done. So, um, sorry, go ahead, David. Um, I just want to add that the catalyst at my school, we're still in very much um, in the pre-planning stages at GEMS. Um, but for those who aren't aware um, of kind of like the demographic of many of the teachers here um, in the Gulf, Gulf Coast um, region is that it is a large black American population of educators, very capable, um, excellent educators that are teaching here. Um, and GEMS, um, my campus, is, it has a sizable population of black American educators, which kind of reflects what's going on in the UAE and, and the greater Gulf Coast region. Um, and so uh, when the when the deaths, uh, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor went down and then, you know, things kind of, that big weekend in Minneapolis um, happened, it was very heavy. Um, and on top of the fact that, you know, we're all in the middle of distance learning. Um, and so the counselors 
uh, the other counselors and myself, um, we were asked by the school um, to kind of support initially new teachers to international school teaching. Um, and I was brave enough and spoke back and said, wait a minute, um, it's not just the first year teachers who are, you know, being challenged and having strong feelings about this. It's myself and other teachers that have been at, the, you know, been overseas for a really long time. And we have to really, um, as a school, um, start asking some serious questions and digging in. Um, and so that was sort of like a catalyst into um, the counselors putting together recommendations um, and being very clear that we're not going to be the ones to um, roll this out for the school, that it has to be a partnership with the administration, the faculty, and of course the counselors um, being the bridge between uh, the, the teachers and the students. Um, so the fact that like the counselors were made that boundary very clear but at the same time like the faculty and the admin were very especially the admin they were very open to it um uh has left me with some positive feelings going into the fall um they've uh they've made a commitment to hiring an outside consultant because that was one of our recommendations is to bring um, an outside consultant um, to help us dig into this deeper. Um, they've had some initial surveys go out to faculty and I think that we're going to be re revisiting that again in August. Um, hopefully we'll all be in the school building because I think it's easier to have these conversations face to face. Um, but I think that uh, my current school is in a a good place, um, you know, when we ended in August in, ter in terms of planning ahead and what we're looking for forward to in the fall. Um, and in addition to that, like um, that initial article that I wrote for uh, ISCA also kind of prompted some conversations within ISCA. Um, and when, um, you know, that first uh, week happened with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and everything. Um, I got a call from Cheryl Brown, who's one of the co-founders of ISCA, and we just had a long conversation about, um, you know, the direction that ISCA wanted to go in with this. And 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 ISCA is very was very committed to taking a strong stance. And so we had we rolled out the um, the counselors as allies, uh, which I helped to co-facilitate, and we initiated those conversations um, with the hope that that was just the spark into more work that we will be doing with our international counseling colleagues down the line. Hmm. Okay, I, I guess one of the questions I have for, for both of you is, um, I know that uh, Yvette briefly spoke about kind of um, key initiatives and making sure that this is a collaboration. It's not just Yvette coming in and talking to institutions and telling them what they need to do for mm -hmm. like 30 minutes and then it's a nice little conference and we can pat ourselves on the back or something, right? This is a ongoing collaboration uh, for long term. So if we're working at institutions and, and I know that um, Kevin allowed me to join his platform and what we were talking about is just making sure that people have metrics to measure change and progress and when we say we're doing anti-racism work what are the the categories we need to focus on just as such as you know i know that a uh, joel has a really awesome um in his article he kind of has key points that he's talking about um specific metrics or specific areas that you need to focus on to kind of dismantle um areas of racism. So if you could provide us with like categories like employment, um, diversity and employment, if that's good at your school, what else can you um, work on um, curriculum? Like kind of what are your top uh, uh, topics or metrics for, for measuring progress? Um, it's in my conversation with, I think one of the impact after the change was that Jane Larson from CIS immediately spoke with me and we, we had a, a very intimate conversation about the possibilities. And one of the things that happened was that the development of the CIS board committee on diversity and inclusion. And although I still would like to propose it to be diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism, 
um, which is really very important. Um, one of the one of the ideas was that the limitation of only focusing it with accreditation is that the the Council of International School is made up of more than a thousand different international schools and universities. And somebody could correct me if I'm wrong with this one, but half only half of the membership um, of the of CIS is under the accreditation process or go through accreditation process. And so it was so wonderful in, in the spirit of partnership with Jane and the CIS to really look into the overarching um, guiding statements of CIS and, and the look, looking into global citizenship and the code of ethics. And that will be more overarching because that will impact all the members of, of the Council of International School. So that's, that's even more powerful. Um, on the other hand, you met going back into, because you know when you talk about change, there's this whole fundamental change and systemic change, but there are also a lot of incremental change that leads to that. So I don't see change as, as very linear and they can be in different pockets. So what we're doing right now in your own areas, let's say for instance in publication, in, in the work that you're doing in identity, um, identity in the classroom, all of these are literature that you have in your classrooms, all of these are part of, part of the different things that we're doing and they will all come together in that unified cause. Um, so looking at that, I think hiring of diverse faculty it really is probably one of the most important um, steps that we could get started. So if I were to mention three, there will be hiring of diverse faculty, hiring of diverse leadership, and, and really looking at your curriculum, the teaching and learning with the lens of social justice. For the most part, we've been talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity. But then internationalism and their cultural competence and global citizenship are mindsets that will support us in in achieving social justice. Oftentimes at our national school, and what I pointed in the article is that we are left with intercultural competence and internationalism as our endpoint, but they should be our leverage for us to be able to move forward into, now that I understand diverse perspective, now they understand um, the inequality of wealth around the world, now they understand that there are challenges and transgression in the LGBTQI plus community, what can I do? How do we examine it with a social justice lens? So that to me is, is the most important thing because if we, if we stay in those mindset, we have to ask ourselves, so what? what? What impact and implications do we have on this on a lasting systemic process? So there are already a plethora of resources that are, that are available in different parts. And I think Twitter is already almost like, um, has so much, so many opportunities for that. But I think going beyond the mindset, going beyond global citizenship, and then what are some of those implications? So one of the opportunities that we have very recently is I attended a, the July Writing Institute with Teachers College. Um, and I shared this one with Yvette and Kevin offline earlier today. Um, you know, sometimes with our, with our positive intention, and especially because our national school is a white Western wealthy privileged community, Sometimes there are blind spots, and it's not because it is your personal fault, but it is really for for white members of a community. It is a, it's a residual in the system. It, it 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 lies in the system, and it's not because it's you. And so we have to go beyond the pain and shame, and that's what one of the authors mentioned is about going beyond the pain and shame, and then we move on into into taking action. So from there, what was presented one time is this whole idea of a video of of, of kids huddled up on one single television and then they were creating their own uh, floating soccer field and all of that and so we all had to respond about what might be the dispositions that kids have to have to show have to use for them to be able to survive in life and so grit and collaboration were mentioned all of these are some of those frameworks that i mentioned earlier about what we teach in schools but then what we often miss out in teaching is that we haven't unpacked the intersectional injustice of why those children are in poverty. So we think beyond the literature and the context that we see in schools, we have to examine for our children, why do you think they're poor? Why, what do you think are the, are the causality that we can see in those? And, so, and then what action can children have 
for them to be able to move forward with that. So I think digging deep into the systemic inequality and the, and the intersectional injustice and oppression would be, would be one thing that we can look into, especially in our teaching and learning. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, Joel, Joel and I, you know, our philosoph philosophies and, and approaches to this um, really do align. Um, we just met today, but <laughs> um, I, I, I am in alignment with what uh, Joel is saying. Um, I'd like to add also is that I think that part of this really needs to, um, part of the work, a big part of the work has to be with faculty and with administration and looking at privilege, um, specifically white privilege, um, and being able to dig into that and um, going beyond the, the shame and blame, but really um, moving towards an anti-racist mindset. Um, and one of the recommendations that the counselors at GAA at my school have made to um, admin is that we have affinity groups um, where, you know, uh, our black and and people of color um, teachers have the opportunity to have their own forum, but at the same time, um, white teachers um, who also identify themselves as white allies have an opportunity to talk amongst themselves as well. And then there will be opportunities for us to come together uh, as the full staff and faculty. Um, the reason why you know, we're pushing for those affinity groups is that I believe that each group does need a safe space to ask questions, to be vulnerable. And that always doesn't happen when we're all together. Um, and so I think, you know, part of that is, is very important. But that also leads into um, those conversations model for us and how we speak to our students about it. Um, and, you know, our students are really, you know, as, as we've seen from the Instagram groups of the Black at International, Sc International School groups that have popped up, um, my former students who've started the Decolonize International Schools movement, um, they're, they're already there. You know, so it's a matter of meeting them halfway in a way, you know. Um, the other day, uh, you know, one of my former students, Swai, who, who co-authored that Decolonize um, International Schools uh, article and survey, uh, said to me, I feel like I'm so young with all these educators speaking to me. And I said, no, you're not young. You're teaching us. You're doing exactly what we hoped the IB diploma would teach you to do. And so now we get to learn um, from you. So that was a huge moment of kind of connection um, where, you know, finally I'm not seeing them as a student anymore, but they are young adults who are um, showing us and leading us the way. And I think we need to follow their lead a little bit in this case. I like that whole idea, Yvette, about um, following their lead. Um, one of the things that I shared with you recently, just now is the podcast that I shared with, um, I recorded with Trisha Friedman, and it really talks about schooling as a political act and teaching as a political act. And I think for, for, for adults, we are, we are navigating it very carefully, whereas with our children right now, they are the ones that are, that are on the street. Some of them are risking their lives on the street and, and I also want to situate ourselves that this is also a space where we're intellectualizing the process, whereas we're intellectualizing racism, whereas for other, for other students, they are on the street fighting for their lives and for, for equality. And so we need, to, we need to be mindful of that as well. So it is, and we can, we can support them in ways where sometimes at some point, it's not being there in front of them, but sometimes opening the space for them um, mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a community. Yes. Um, I, I, looking at your article and, and hearing um, the conversation back and forth, um, I can't help but call out the turquoise elephant in the room, right? Uh, you know, the, like you said, Yvette is, is correct in my experience. Um, the young people are, that we're teaching and educating are there. Um, they they are on the ball. They're, they're they're meeting this moment, but their parents not so much. <laughs> and when we do this kind of work, there's two factors I've noticed comes up. 
one, uh, the biggest one, I'll start with the biggest one basically is, uh, I speak to maybe some people in institutions and, and positions of power. And the first thing is, these are great ideas, beautiful. This is a beautiful world you're trying to create. But, starts with the S, our stakeholders might not feel comfortable. <laughs> um, our sponsors might, the, our, the, our stakeholders might not feel comfortable with the ideas that you're trying to push forward or the, this, this is, this, um, we might not be able to get this through because of our stakeholders or whoever's funding school, especially since we're talking about institution, uh, international schools tend to be on the, upper echelon in terms of funding. So what would you say to, um, to people who are interested in, 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 in really there to, to push the work forward, but they're concerned about budgets, what's gonna happen with certain funders? Are they gonna feel comfortable with all this diversity? Are they gonna feel comfortable with all these changes? What do you say about budget? And also the second elephant in the room, which is parents as well. Sometimes parents are coming from a particular, maybe a homogenous society you're working in, mm -hmm. um, particularly in Asia. When I was in Asia, um, they, they, you know, um, loved it. I stayed there for several years, but there's obvious issues with particularly anti-Blackness in Asia. So how do you deal with parents' circumstance um, and kind of getting them on board with with your your initiatives and also dealing with stakeholders um before the end of the school year we were actually pretty adamant that we get a message out to parents um even with all the craziness of trying to get graduation through and um and uh closing out the school year with grades and everything. So we did push out an initial um, email with resources for parents. Um, I think that as a counseling team, we're planning to have coffee mornings surrounding that uh, topic of, um, you know, looking at bias and anti-racism. Um, although we haven't worked out the logistics yet um, since we're on summer holiday, but I think that those conversations are definitely coming. Um, it is important to bring the parents on board. I'd be hard pressed to think that any parent will say no to, you know, um, discussing bias and things like that um, in the classroom. Um, but I do know that, you know, there are some legitimate concerns in terms of how it's rolled out and they need to be um, on the ball, on the same page with us from day one in order for it to be successful, for sure. Thanks for the question, Tony. Um, I, I grapple the same thing with the same question too. Um, on on, on the, short, the short answer to it would be, we, we have a responsibility to educate our parents the way we have a responsibility to educate our students. Um, transformation of hearts and mind is something that, is, that, is the, that lives and breathes in education. And there are so many changes that already happened in the past from innovation to the use of technology, we will always have resistance. We will always have people and parents and stakeholders who would say, well, why do, why do we use this? We, we've always done it this way. But then as we continue to leverage and really at the very heart of our conversation is the why, that it is a child protection issue, that it is, it is a human rights issue. It, it, to me, it, it, it makes me, if there are people and parents and stakeholders and leadership and governance and board who will question some of those, I also question their values and beliefs. And so that to me is, is something where, on, on one hand, that's within the school. And so being a, an, an accreditation evaluation evaluator in, in, for CIS and for NIAS, I also know that accreditation is one that can really they can provide a, a, a specific benchmark and standard and structure that will compel schools to, to change. And we know that that is so, and that's the reason why that if we include anti-racism in some of those benchmarks and some of those standards, there's no racial equity detour. The schools will be, will be compelled to say, all right, in the governance level, we need 
diverse representation in, in the board. Because when you've got different people and different representation in, in, in all its intersectionalities, you know that the decisions within that, it's a strength. So the decision within that board will, will be able to encompass so many of those layers of intersectionality. So when we, come, when we develop intentionally because of a standard, if, because of a response to a standard, the board will be made up of different people with different diverse um, points of view. So to me, going back to that idea of racism lives within, our, within a system. And so we address it as well systemically so that there's no, so as you do that, you narrow the filter. And so there's no excuses and detour that schools can have. It's right there, it's part of our accreditation. It is part of our code of ethics. It's, it's a requirement for membership. And it, it compels us to, to do those. So when we have a conversation with parents, the accreditation evaluation and report in our self-study becomes a, a third point for us. So it's not gonna be an adversarial, it's not gonna be between you and me, but it becomes here's the accreditation standard and this is what we're reaching for, for us to be able to achieve and develop a diverse, equitable, inclusive and just world. All right, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break off into um, some breakout rooms. And in those rooms, we'll allow folks time just to reflect on what you heard from Yvette and from Joel, um, a time to share um, things, actions that you've observed you know, in your context, and then an opportunity to share um, you know, as we, and I know some schools are you know, in progress or getting ready to, um, be back in progress. I know the Middle East is a little bit different because you all recently went on holiday, but some are, some schools are getting ready to um, begin not too soon from now. So as you think about um, what you heard, what you've observed, um, and then sharing actions that you plan on taking um, or actions that you have taken. So we'll post those questions and we'll put you into breakout rooms. Those questions will be in the chat. And just so everyone knows, we do um, not record the breakout rooms. And that's just so people can have intimate conversations um, and open conversations. So I will pause the record. Um, first off, for coming in and definitely um, Kevin's commitment to doing this work day in, day out with this platform. Um, and, and Joel and Yvette, your insight was, was definitely valuable and I hope it was valuable for others as well. Um, I guess the remarks or the final things I would say is simply um, if you are one to, to, to um, celebrate the small victories, um, because I did notice some people in our breakout groups are saying, well, maybe we have a book club, you know, and other people are, are saying maybe that's the first step. Well, that's a, you, you better celebrate that. <laughs> I say that only because, you, as you know, this is a long term game. This is a marathon. So you, you need to have some kind of something to inspire you or, or to notice incremental changes so you don't burn out. Um, and uh, also, when we're talking about um, anti racist work, just and, you know, it affects everyone, like we said, so everyone has to do work regardless of what nationality, what race, uh, what gender, sexuality you identify with. It, it's, it's everybody's hands on deck to, to do the work um, and be honest and realistic about what you personally can do and what you have access to. Um, and the last point is, you know, this is a multifaceted beast or a multifaceted situation. So um, I like how um, Joel has wonderful points of um, in his article that he wrote um, about just uh, points that I believe four or five points um, talking about relationships, um, talking about the different aspects, ch children protection, which was um, an awesome point actually to point out because many people don't make that cross. But um, just because your school is diverse, that doesn't that might not necessarily mean that anti-racist work is, is, is being done. What is the other blind spots that we have? Um, um, and meeting every place where they're at. Um, we don't want to create an adversarial relationship with groups. We want to create a uh, push to, to push them in the right direction, um, but meet them where they're at and know that it's a long-term uh, 
process. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for joining. I see a lot of familiar faces and names um, on the list. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's really amazing to see us all to come together, especially on our summer holiday with Corona kind of hanging over us and all these other things. So thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, I just want to pick a piggyback off of what Tony is saying, that it's okay to start off small. Um, and in fact, that small victory can lead into this domino effect. And that's one of the last thoughts that we talked about in our, um, in our breakout, breakout group today was that, you know, being okay with starting off small, it could be a, um, you know, it could be a book club, um, you know, or it could be just a chat group where you are all checking in on each other um, and sharing some updates or news or you know, positive resources, um, you know, because we're not going to conquer Rome in a day. Um, this is, this is an ongoing thing. Um, and, and like Tony said, it's a marathon. Um, but as a counselor, I remind everyone to please take care of yourselves in this process. And it's okay to take a break. It's okay to, you know, I'm going to be spending my day at the pool on Friday. Um, now that the pools are finally open here in Abu Dhabi. Um, give yourselves that opportunity to have a rest um, because we are no good to our students come September when we're starting off the school exhausted, school year exhausted. So um, I hope everyone takes care of themselves and um, you know, keep doing all the great work that you're all doing already. Thank you. Um, yeah, to, to everybody, I just would like to say thanks for, for all that you are and all that you do, wherever you are in the continuum of growth in, in your work towards anti-racism. Um, some of the thoughts that I have just as a parting word is that we, just, we go back to our why and the compelling reason why we're doing this work. Um, ask, we ask ourselves as we reflect and we ask our international community and our schools, what are the possibilities? So really, as we continue to do this work, operate in such a way that it's in a spirit of partnership. It's a spirit of shared accountability as opposed to an adversarial you against me because we will win together when we are working on it together. Um, be kind to yourselves. I think that Yvette mentioned that and Tony as well. Be kind to each other and be a placeholder for other people and kind in such a way that this is not only a struggle for BIPOC individuals, but this is also a struggle for, for our white colleagues because this is also a, 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 a time of reckoning. And so be kind to each other. Um, and then on a logistical note, that we have created a, a Slack group that has anti-racist, um, all it's, it's relationship building, it's connection, it is, um, and if you can leave your email with, with Kevin, and I think we can curate this one today and I can, I can send out that link to everybody where you can participate from, from different group chats, different anti-racism framework, or to just like seek out a partnership with, with other schools. And even if you're that one person in your own group, in your own school, you can reach out to other people. There are already different people doing different work and and, and, and it will be wonderful. And, and to our international school leaders who are here, um, I know Liz is here, Pauline is here, Peter is here. You think about our power and privilege in, 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 in advocating and supporting our leadership within the school. Um, I think you have, you have that um, capacity to be able to make those changes. It's so wonderful to see all, all of you here as well. So we're hoping that our next move there will be more international school leaders who will, who will be here who are making an impact and making a difference in and are listening to, to everybody. Um, I think that is the most important thing. We, oftentimes we think about listening to people who are already talking. The last thing we need to remember is that who are the people who are not talking? And I want to leave it with listen to the silence, listen to the silent, and listen to the silenced. Those are three different stories. Thank you, everybody, and take care of yourselves. Thank you, Joe. Can you say that one more time before we turn over to Meadow, please? Um, we, we have to be accountable in listening to the silence, to listening to the silent, and listening to those who are silenced. I like that. Is that you, Joel, or is that somebody that we should be quoting? Or? 
it's it's oh. just it's just me. I just played around with it. <laughs> okay, just wanted to make sure. Oh. But it is of course it is built up from all the experiences and listening to other people as well. But but really, when it comes to social justice, you know, it's it's really about who are those people that we haven't heard yet, and so we need to invite them in. I love that, Joel, and that's a perfect segue to um, what I have to say, uh, which is really extending an invitation to all of you to write for Thai. Um, I'm currently preparing the uh, back to school issue, our big fall issue of the print uh, edition of our newspaper. Sorry for the construction noise if you hear it outside. Um, uh, so deadline is August 15th for inclusion in, in that issue of the newspaper. But as you know, we also have a dionic online presence at tieonline.com and we have our regular newsletters. Um, so there is no limit to you know, the number of voices that we can include. Thai is a reader-driven publication, and we want to hear from all of you. We also want to um, kind of activate you as, as um, folks who you know, can really uh, work to multiply the voices in that space. So, so um, Erica um, made a great point in our, in our breakout session we can't forget staff. Staff are vital members of this conversation. Um, so who are the staff members in your communities uh, who have contributions to make to the con conversation? Um, and uh, the students. Um, we, uh, Ty uh, really supports student perspectives. Um, in fact, you know, we're building out more and more space for that. Um, and so uh, as Yvette was saying, you know, the, 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 a lot of these students, they're already there, they're teaching us, they're way ahead of us. So um, please, you know, uh, pass on my email address, editor at tieonline.com. And finally, I, I, I just wanna say that um, there's a theorist, Benedict Anderson, um, who had a book uh, about a decade or so ago, um, Imagined Communities. Um, and his, his notion is um, that, newspapers what 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 happened when uh you know when the newspaper revolution occurred is that um it was possible to um begin imagining ourselves um in in new ways beyond national borders uh and and, and such i really think of thai as an imagined community for the international school sector and it's a place where we get to reimagine ourselves who do we want to be going forward. Um, and, and so again, just inviting all of you to be in touch um, and, and thank you um, for sharing your perspectives because um, without, without you, without you know, these conversations, um, I can't do my job well, honestly. Um, so I'm, I'm really relying, relying on, on all of you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to Kevin, Joel, all of you, Yvette. And again, thank you to Brittany, to Meadow, Ty Online. Thank you to Tony, to Yvette, to Joel. Um, just acknowledge folks who are in the chat. I want to make sure I do that. Um, again, we invite you to the commitment to action. Tawana, we agree. We want to make these longer. I know we're always aware of the summer. Um, Peter, thank you. Yep, we're going to be, the next conversation is next week with Nadine uh, Richards, Diversity, Challenges, and Opportunities. Um, let me see just scrolling down because I'd like to make sure we acknowledge folks who have um, written um, ideas. I definitely agree, um, Tawana and Erica, it's not about just that but, it's about the and, which is why in the, we have acknowledged that COVID and um, racism and anti-racism work needs to be worked on. Um, Jessica, thank you so much. I agree that it's um, not seeing the work as extra, um, that it's integrated. Um, and thank you for being part of the community. We'll send those follow-up Slack resources um, thank you for that feedback about the, the breakout rooms. We feel like a lot of people have given that feedback of having that small, intimate time. Um, no worries if you missed out. We will send out the, um, the link to the recording. Um, these sessions will be recorded and available to everyone. We post them on um, AIELOC.org under webinars and events. Um, again, thank each and every one of you for, we know, like uh, it was said, it's your summertime. Thank you for joining us. Um, we usually hang out for some minutes. If you want to hang out with us, feel free. Um, but if you want to chime out, because I know some of you are in different time zones, so we respect that. But thanks again for joining us. Uh, we throw on tunes. We hang out. If you want to hang out, hang out for a few minutes. 
Um, but thanks again. And next uh, session we'll have will be 29th of, uh, of July. That will be up and coming. Thanks very much for this. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Tony, Tony, thank you, sir. Yeah, appreciate it. I this I learned a um, learned a lot about, or maybe not learned, but like reinforcement. You know, getting that reinforcement.